You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family, today we have Mr. Gary Lipsky on the call. Great individual, specializes in asset management. His company, Break of Day Capital, focuses out in the Tucson and Phoenix, Arizona market. So other side of the country from where Quattro focuses, but great group. We, we have met these guys at conferences and I'm actually going to be in Kauai, out in, on the beautiful island of Kauai with him and his team later this year at a mastermind we're going to. So great people. But yeah, we're going to get into a great book that they wrote. So stay tuned for the title and clickable link. But we're going to get into asset management and some of the lessons that his group has learned and, and the the methods they've put in place to prevent those from happening. So whether you're an investor or you're an operator, this episode has a lot for you. So if you get any value out of this or any episode we've ever done, please like us on, on social media, subscribe on YouTube, and more, more importantly, right here in the show on the podcast, five-star review and thoughtful comment. That's the only way to pay it forward. So whatever you're listening to this on, scroll down right now, just hit the button. It takes you literally 0.5 seconds. And that helps us get the show out to more people just like you. You cannot advertise these things. You just have to pay it forward and get more listeners that way. So we appreciate you for that. If you want to follow us on Facebook, all the partners are on team or at Team Quattro Capital, one word, no special characters, or at Real Estate Runway Podcast on TikTok and YouTube for the last two. And we're all on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. So interact with us wherever you are. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Folks, if you want to be on the show, check us out at thequattroway.com slash podcast. And if you want to look at investing with Team Quattro, we are always ready to have a conversation with you. Thequattroway.com slash invest is the best way to do that. So without further ado, let's get right into today's featured presentation. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your captain, Chad Sutton. We are here to take off on another flying adventure in real estate investing. So I'm so excited to get Mr. Gary Lipsky on the phone today with Break of Day Capital. Gary, this one's been a long time coming. I think we connected through the Black Card membership and we have just been, I know our teams have been in the same place, same time, lots of conferences. It's a pretty small world in the world of operators, but good to have you on the show finally. Welcome. How's it going, brother? Thanks for having me, Chad. Uh, yeah, excited to be on. Appreciate it. As is tradition, before we get into the meat of the episode today, I want to know about you, Gary. So tell me about your, kind of your journey to get to the point of where you are today, all the relevant things so that we can then get into some of the lessons that we're going to talk about on the show today. Yeah, I've been an entrepreneur for most of my life, never really worked for anyone else. And in high school, I, I shoveled driveways and auto detailed cars. And I grew up in New Jersey. In college, I started a restaurant delivery service like a, a Postmates or a DoorDash now. Certainly, I didn't have that kind of vision. I wish I did at that time, but it was just great experiences of, of learning how to manage people and and your success is dependent upon you. There's no one else to blame. It's on you to, to handle all the aspects. And it was great to build off of that. And then eventually I, I co-produced three low budget independent films in my twenties. Then I started a after school outdoor and leadership development company. And I sold that in 2016. We were working with 9,000 at risk youth daily at schools and we had a team of 700 employees and another 700 independent contractors. And I had been investing in real estate for quite a while, but this kind of, when I sold that company, it gave me the runway and the time to get into real estate full-time. And when you look at that, it's like many different lives, but it was always the creative part of me and the business side of me, which is the perfect blend for real estate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you've seen some other walks of life in the business world. I got to know when you, you you mentioned the creative and the business side come together, but you know what attracted you to real estate, specifically multifamily real estate, which I believe your company is primarily focused in from the ventures that you came from? Yes. For my houses, I did a lot of research on finding like really good neighborhoods, but like always looking for that value add, even with my own home for my kids and everything. I didn't want to pay, I, I live in LA now. I didn't want to pay top dollars to live in like Beverly Hills. What's a really good neighborhood with, with the good schools that has, it's going to appreciate over time. 
I bought a house. We opened up the kitchen and converted the garage to an office space. So I was, I didn't realize at the time that I was thinking as a, a value add operator, but that was giving me those steps. And, and the first year was really research and figuring out where in real estate, because there's, it's that squirrel effect and every or shiny object, like that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. But multifamily is like running a business. So when I found that, I was like, okay, this is for me. I scale just add a zero to to things. And it made sense. It was, I think I found my home. Yeah, I do. And it's interesting because what you just mentioned resonated with me. When people say, hey, I'm in real estate, that's like saying, hey, I'm in medicine or hey, I'm a doctor. It's okay. A doctor of what? Are you a doctor of podiatry? Are you a dentist? There's so many different avenues of real estate you can go down. Everything from single family all the way up to large high-rise commercial office buildings and everything in between. So I love what you said there is it was really similar to the value add deals you were doing in your, on your single family side of of, of the world and with your personal homes. But then anyway, you see where I'm going with it, but let's kind of transition over here. And I know you've got a book out there related to asset management. I'd love to first know what that book is and where the audience can find it. And folks, there'll be a link for this in the show notes, just giving you a little preview there. But I'd love to go through some of the lessons that you learned along your career as you were operating some of the, what, 10 or 11 deals that your group has operated and what, how that led into your book on asset management. So first of all, what is that book? Let's start there. Yeah, it's called the best in class and you can find it on Amazon and it was released a little over two years ago. Yeah. Fantastic. So folks, we will put a link in the show notes, but look for that. If you just would rather do it on your own, that's fine best in class on Amazon. But let's, so let's start with a couple of lessons that you learned along the way that, yes. uh, yeah, let's go there. Everything in there covers from acquisition to disposition, but certainly when we were writing the book, we didn't know everything. And so we started a podcast on asset management and just brought in experts and that kind of like rocket fueled our, 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 our education, because if we didn't know something, we, we brought someone that we was respected sure. and had a lot of experience in that particular area and asking the questions that we wanted to, to know. So that helped us. Certainly there was, when we started the book, there was that uh, a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome. Who are we to write a book on, on asset management? We hadn't done much. We're not 10, 15 year uh, operators, but eventually we were able to put that aside and, and write this book from our perspective as fairly new into the industry, but the guy I wrote the book with and myself, we had a lot of business experience and we just simplified things for people of how we charted all of our properties through Google Drive, which is free. So anyone can use it. Every, all, every, the whole team can access it. And we just, every time we would just simplify and improve for everyone to be a part of it. But you talked about lessons learned. There's, it's always about fixing problems. Nothing goes perfectly. And if you have that mindset, you're going to do very well because it's always hurting cats, being proactive. We have an acronym I I like to use called MAP and it's measure everything. Have your team accountable. That's where the A comes in and P proactiveness. And so just measuring everything and talking to your team on a consistent basis and getting things done, you're going to be way ahead of everyone else versus a lot of people, I think, rely too much on their property management and take a back seat and things aren't getting done. If, if, if the team isn't being held accountable, if the things aren't getting measured, they're going to chill out because they're seeing you chill out. So you've really got to manage the manager. Yeah, I love the way you said that. And I always cringe when I hear the word manage the manager because it's become how we talk about this. But the way you just said it makes a lot of sense. Problem is a matter of perspective, right? That's one thing I've learned through, through many different coaching seminars I've been part of. Problem, problems are a matter of perspective. And so what, what does that mean, folks? It means the property manager will do a great job running the property to their perspective, right? And what does that typically mean? If I'm managing a fee-based management company, I'm not looking at equity. I'm looking at how do I keep as low a payroll usage on the property how do I keep the, at the, ocu- the occupancy up? How do I keep units full? How do I minimize what I have to do from a work perspective? It's the opposite of what we want to do as value add operators, which is pushing 
the envelope on rents, pushing the envelope on what we actually spend on the property, like to the lower degree, aggressively doing work on units and getting things leased up before they're ever ready. So we have minimal downtime. That's very uncomfortable, but it's an uncomfortable way to run a property. And so what he's saying here, I love that. That was that acronym map measure, be accountable and be proactive. Like those three things. Oh my gosh. Cause you're right. It is like herding cats. There is all, and all pro formas are wrong, folks. I'm sorry to tell you, if you're a great underwriter and you have a really complicated spreadsheet and you're awesome, I do too. And I feel like I'm awesome when I put it on paper, but you know what? It's wrong. Literally the day after you close, right? It's just going to, it's, it's like a, a GPS that you try to follow the map, but you're going to have detours and you're going to have things that don't go according to plan, just like these herding cats. And Matt, I love the way you said that. So well done there. Well, keep going, man. These lessons are golden. Yeah. And I think what, when you're talking about the pro forma, it's having buffers. Um, when you're doing your CapEx, have lots of reserve money, roof, electric, plumbing. Even if things are in perfect condition, things are going to break. When you're looking at your budget, have lower occupancy than, than what you really think you're going to get. Have expenses higher than you might project because everything ends up costing more. Everything takes longer. So having these buffers will serve you well. You always want to under promise and overperform and your investors will keep coming back time and time again. And it, don't chase the IR. I see so many deals with these ridiculously high IRs and I'm like, how are they doing it? How are they promising that? It's just, that's dangerous game. I'd rather come in, hey, I'm going to be lower than a lot of other people at like 15%, but I feel really good about beating that. When I always want to beat it. When we're not beating it, I'm like, I'm disappointed as far as our monthly projections and everything. Yeah. And it's really funny how that works too, because the, I think it's just human psyche, right? You, you rather w would protect your downside than increase your upside. And I know in investors, if you're on here listening, I know it's tempting to say, well, this deal has a 20 IRR and this one has 15. They must be better. They, I can make a spreadsheet say that too. That's really all it is numbers that like garbage in, garbage out, but it's just numbers on a spreadsheet. And what I will tell you from experience, ask me how I know. I am much happier and the investor is much happier if I put 15% on paper and I hit 20 than if I put 17% and I hit 16. It's funny how it works. It's if you don't hit that threshold, like that's the threshold in the mind and, and it still may be a great outcome, great investment, but back to the operators and you really shouldn't hold your own feet to the fire because you just can't know. Just take the, Gary, let, let's go down this path for a second. As an operator, I'm sure you've seen some pressures lately, right? And the pressures are, Look, the income line is fine. As long as you bought anything decent, you didn't chase IRR and you bought a good asset in a good area, it's probably still growing. Income's probably doing just fine. Maybe you're down a percentage or two in economic occupancy, but okay, you're still in the mid nineties for the most part. Expenses. We've seen payroll go up 30%. Insurance in some areas are up 10 to 50% or more. It's like when you think about stuff like that, you just can't underwrite for some of this stuff. So. I, yeah. I guess the challenge here, and maybe we'll turn that back over to you, is what you're seeing there, but you just can't know all of this stuff. So if you've already promised a pro forma where everything from the stars to the moon have to align to get there, you're probably going to be in trouble. Absolutely. And that's why you have those buffers. And that's why you add more expenses than you really think. You add uh, a little bit more vacancy. Protect yourself, protect your investors, because if it's razor thin, then that's a deal you need to pass on. You've got to have some room for things not going perfect because nothing goes perfect. Even our deals that have been really tough from day one are end up being pretty good because of the way we underwrote and had our reversion cap was so much higher than where things got. Now, that part of it is taking advantage of uh, the market timing and whatnot, but Having extra levers to, to pull is much better than manipulating the IRR in the beginning and then you're screwed. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. Wow. So, you know, lay one or two more of these on me. So I don't want to give the book away, but if, if there's like a mega theme or two in the book that, that maybe we could attract the, the reader to listen to here, what, what would one or two of those be that, that you think are like the two most important things that book goes into? 
Yeah, I think is our weekly spreadsheet having the property management company will send us like a 20 page weekly report. And some of the pages are sideways and whatnot. And it's in a PDF form. There's really, it's not a good tracking device. So we have a Google tracker and every week is a new tab. So I can look back two years, three years and know exactly where we were as far as occupancy, delinquency, rents. We have a tab for accountability. So if we have a task, who's assigned to it? When was it assigned? When is it due? What needs to happen? And it's just, we go to back to it every week. And, and, and so if you haven't completed the task, you look silly. If you don't remember what you need to do, go to the Google form. You just get it done before the next meeting, quite honestly. But it's there for everyone to see. It's a very simple form and, and it's got all the data, all the KPIs that we need to have a meaningful, quick discussion about the property. And then everyone can go back to doing what they are doing versus wasting a lot of time and and energy. Yeah, that's a really powerful one. And folks, what that is right there is effective communication, right? And and it it, it doesn't matter if it's a spreadsheet or whatever you decide to do. Let's go back to the analogy, Gary. We're on the Real Estate Runway podcast, right? We're flying in a plane, learning about real estate here. Use the analogy of dials in a cockpit. One of my favorite mentors, Keith Cunningham, he's a big accounting guy, business accounting, talks about you cannot see what you don't measure. And so what you're talking about is I don't want, you get great financials monthly. That's awesome. But by the time you see those, they're four to five, maybe even six weeks old. By the time you get them, you're reacting at that point. Whereas if you're getting weekly KPIs, that is weekly dials in a cockpit, that tell you the the lifeblood of your property, of the things you care about that are going to drive your NOIs at the end of the day, that's the goal, right? And if you have a way that you can have meaningful conversations with your team about those and also issue actions and track follow-up, because that's important too, when you run 28 assets, that's important. You got to make sure you remember what you talked about two weeks ago or a week ago. But if you're running things like that, you can't help but track towards your goals, right? Whereas if you made the exact point earlier, Gary, that if you take a passive seat to this, think about flying a plane with a passive pilot, how terrifying that would be. Like I'm sure, and and we'll even go back to, let's go back to maybe even older times. It used to take, what, 30 men to sail a ship or something like that. If you don't have someone at the helm steering and directing and making sure that they're reading all the the, the physical, not dials, but physical indicators on the boat of what's going on. Everyone else will just keep sailing away, keep tacking the sails, keep rolling up anchor, whatever it is you used to do on a boat. I don't know. I'm not a seaman. But if you think about it that way, if you're not driving the helm, the ship could crash itself blindly into a into land or something like that. So cannot ex- accentuate the importance of that enough, Gary. I think we've got time for one more. I want to. I'm really loving this discussion because folks, Pete, acquisitions and and buying property and investing, it's all sexy stuff, but you really need to be looking under the hood at how are these properties going to be run? How is the sponsor going to attain the returns they're talking about? So give me one more, Gary. I'm loving this conversation. Yeah. So we'll we'll be flying over about 10,000 feet, let's say, and looking at occupancy, certain KPIs, but we want to dive down. Let's get really granular. Okay. So we're at 95% occupancy. What does that look like per unit type? Maybe a a few of my units are at 99% and that's too high. We need to push the rents up. Maybe one unit type is at 80%. And so I need to lower rents just a little bit and see if that works to get them filled up if they've been sitting for a while. But if I was staying at 10,000 feet, I would say 95%, we're good. Keep rolling. But by diving in a little bit deeper to that granular level, uh, I'm able to see where we can tweak the knobs, where we can move some levers to to maximize revenue. That's one of the things. We're going to look at our conversions just because we have 100 leads from, let's say, apartment list. How many actually turn into leases? So if we're getting, maybe it's Facebook Marketplace that's converting the most to leases, and maybe we double down on that, but getting Getting granular on a lot of things lets us figure out where the bottlenecks are, where we need to improve. And it's a team effort that we're trying to figure out how to best maximize our resources, our time, and our efforts to to maximize NOI at the end of the day. So if we get all the team thinking that way, thinking ownership thinking, we get a, a lot more bang for our buck from our property management. 
Yeah, I love that. And folks, I heard two things of what Gary was talking about here. I know RealPage does this. I don't know if every software does this, but we use RealPage exclusively now. So in RealPage, there's this beautiful report called the box score. You can pull it as of any date, go back in time. You can do projected, all that kind of stuff. But the box score, is it's really just a box with data in it. And it breaks down exactly what Gary's talking about here. It breaks down by unit or by floor plan type, whatever you have loaded into your rent roll, it will break out percentage occupied by floor plan and total marketed rent, effective rent, the things that have been available for how long. It's a pretty great report to see really quickly. I'm talking moments glance. Do I have problems or where do I have problems? You can, within a moment's notice, know, ooh, my two bedrooms may not be doing as well as my threes or something like that. But then what I heard you go down the path of is how do you take data that you may have and diagnose that problem? You're going to have some kind of marketing data. Maybe it's Zumper. Maybe it's Facebook Marketplace. Maybe it's real page syndication, maybe apartments.com, whatever it is. You can get that data and see where you're going, but ultimately you have to tweak where you're putting that to see if you're getting the right population. And you measure that by, okay, am I getting, how many applications am I getting? How many are getting denied? Am I even reaching the right? If you're marketing a 2000 a month property and you're getting applications that can only afford a thousand a month, you're marketing to the wrong people. So figure that out. How many are getting denied? How many are getting canceled? And then if, if the number are getting canceled, why are people paying application fees and canceling applications? What's going on? And then from there, how many are converting to leases? Because leases are actually what make you money. So very good points there, Gary. I love that. Before we go to the Quattro questions, Gary, you guys, I want to talk about about your company a little bit. You know, y'all are 11 deals in. You've had three great exits. You've got a fund going on right now. L- let's talk about what that is, why it's important, what's in it for the investor, and, and what y'all are going after right now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We just put a 256-unit property under contract in Tucson about two weeks ago. It's our ninth deal in Tucson. And we're putting in a fund. We'll have three to five assets in there. And what we're looking to do is create minimize risk for our investors by pulling a bunch of, of properties together. They're going to minimize their downside and still have that upside when we hit a home run. And if one property is struggling with cash flow, then others can lift it up too with cash flow. So it's a, a really great way to protect our investors, particularly in, in times like this. And we'll still have the same criteria. We're not going to be chasing deals or doing deals just to do deals. That's really important to. When you have a fund, it's not, there's no gun to our head to do a bad deal, but we're going to still do the same great deals, same value at play, but lump a couple of properties together. That is fantastic, Gary. And, and just, I love asking this question because I feel like funds fit in one or two camps. Is this going to be like a, you're going to launch with the current property and go buy three or four just like it, but is this fund going to experience like a rebalancing concept over time? Or is everyone coming in on the front end and you just buy them as soon as you can, but the money sits there until it's ready to buy? Like, how are y'all structuring this thing? Yeah, yeah, there'll be some rebalance. So for those, there'll be a, uh, a discount for those that come in. And as time goes on, they'll just have to pay the the interest if they come in much later. But we'll probably get a bunch that are jump in from the very beginning, which is great, you know? Yeah, that's fantastic. Great deal, Gary. Great deal. Let's transition over to the Quattro question, and I'll let you get back to your busy day of running that portfolio. So question number one, what is your superpower and uh, how does it benefit you? I'd have to say asset management and it, it helps us bring extraordinary returns to our investors. And, and we look at it as win. We want to create a win for our residents and a win for our investors. I love that. Flip the coin over, Gary. What is your biggest failure, life or business, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, a communication, I think, is is definitely something that I've gotten a lot better at. I, I still have more room. But it's how we communicate, we're making sure we're communicating our vision, our expectations. And if something isn't working right, then I have to look at myself and say, hey, maybe I didn't communicate it the right way. And making people feel empowering them as part of our team. So Communication always something that I feel I can, and there's always more room to grow. Oh yeah. And as the entrepreneur, as folks, everything is your fault. You just have to accept it once you take responsibility and realize it doesn't matter if it was you, it's your fault. So let's go. Let's just fix it and move on. Fantastic. One of Quattro's four pillars is philanthropy. That is people coming together around a property to generate profits, people, property, profits. 
and then philanthropy, coming back around and taking care of people. So I love to give my guests an opportunity to talk about where they're giving back. And you'd be surprised we've had some instances where people on this show have given on your behalf. What is that for you? Please share your philanthropic heart here. Yeah, giving back is very important to us. We most recently did a donation to OR for trafficking, sex trafficking, and we've given to the local education foundation here. I've spoken to a bunch of youth at Pretend City down in Orange County, uh, not too far from me in Los Angeles. And I, we also gave a donation there. So we're always giving back to groups that we, that we like their mission and the money goes towards the, the programming and whatnot. So it's, it's, it, it is a very important to us as well. I love that. Folks, it's so important to do well and do good at the same time. And it's doing good while doing well is something we fully believe in. It, it is totally possible to make a great living and also do good in this world. So keep that in mind, folks. I love it. And as a reminder, before we let you go, Gary, let's mention the book again, but also mention the podcast. We didn't really go into the podcast at all. This is a part of the show where we, we do some shameless plugs on that. So mention the book again and mention the podcast and where we can find that. Yep. The book is called uh, Best in Class and you can find it on Amazon. You can go to our website and the Real Estate Investor Podcast. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Fantastic. And folks, all those links in the show notes for your clicking pleasure. No worries. Gary, what's the best way to get in touch with you and your team if people want to reach out, talk more, invest, things of that sort? Yeah, people can reach out to uh, breakofdaycapital.com. It's got all of our resources there. We've got an investor resources tab. You can find out about our latest deals, find out for about our um, monthly newsletter. Everything is there on the website. We're on social media. So definitely follow us as well. All right, Gary, thank you for coming on the show, sharing all these nuggets. Folks, I hope you learned something and I'd love to have you back on sometime soon or maybe we'll cross paths at a conference again. I don't know. Sounds good, Chad. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that show with Gary Lipsky today. We had a lot of great nuggets to talk about. My favorite, I think, was talking about the weekly spreadsheet that dynamic that they have with their management company, just being able to course correct weekly and have just a clean, dashboard of dials to look at, a clean action list to follow up on. Super powerful. Check that out. Go check them out at breakofdaycapital.com. They've got some of the stuff to share with you. So with, without further ado, we're going to end the episode today. If you got any value out of the show, please scroll down, leave us that five-star review and thoughtful comment or subscribe to us, like us on YouTube if that's where you are. That's the only way for us to grow this show and get to more people just like you. So pay it forward share it with a person or two, and we'd love to have them as listeners as well. If you want to be on the show, we'd love to do these interviews with you as well, thequattroway.com slash podcast to apply. And we are always looking to partner with new people in the investment space. We are happy to work with you if you're looking for a place to deploy capital and work with Quattro team, thequattroway.com slash invest is where you can do that. So until next time, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. Over and out, folks. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.